A herd of ornithopods move on their migration, but small predators run rings around their group. They are looking for the small, the weak. Alone they are too small to pose a threat, but the herd has drawn many. Their eyes scan the herd and each other, searching for opportunities to split the herd and join with the others. The sun is setting. By the time it rises again, the herd will be short one member. Welcome to this dinosaur profile on Deinonychus, or Deinonychus if you're American, arguably the most important dinosaur ever discovered. Not only is it of great scientific interest, but also as a species of dinosaur raptor of great pop culture attention. In fact, I am confident that this is the first of my videos that many of you have seen. If you want the pop cultural raptor misconceptions, I would advise you to watch the whole video, but if you're short on time, here's the sections and timestamps. Feathers, door opening, speed, that claw, pack hunting, and intelligence. The first Deinonychus was pretty much stumbled over by Barnum Brown in 1931, several decades after he had discovered the first partial skeletons of Tyrannosaurus and Ankylosaurus. He was focused on an ornithopod, Tenontosaurus, near Billings in Montana. He recorded signs of a carnivorous dinosaur encased in lime and called it Daptosaurus agilis. He also found some fragments of skull and some overlarge teeth, and decided to call the animal Megadontosaurus, or Big Toothed Lizard. All of this he took back to the American Museum of Natural History, where he intended to fully excavate the carnivorous dinosaur, mount it in the museum, and formally name and describe his finds. He just never got round to it. Tenontosaurus was the only one of these three finds that kept the name he gave it. This is why you have to formalise things. Over 30 years later, in 1964, John Ostrom was excavating a site near Bridger, also in Montana. Over two years, his team collected more than 1,000 bones of one species of dinosaur. These made up 50 entries in the Peabody Museum's catalogue, and belonged to a minimum of three animals. No one can be sure on the exact number. There was enough material to create two feet from one individual which would become the defining feature of the animal. The distinctive claw was similar to that of a little dinosaur found a decade earlier in Mongolia. It consisted of a crushed skull and a large curved claw, thought at the time to belong to the hand of the animal. This little dinosaur was known as Velociraptor. Ostrom gathered together his find and compared them with what had been extracted from the lump of rock Brown had excavated, and found that they were the same animal. In fact, Megadontosaurus was a chimera, made up of the creature's teeth and the small skull of a completely different dinosaur. Ostrom decided to call this little dinosaur Microventus solaire, and his new clawed carnivore Deinonychus antiropus. He scientifically described them, he got to name them. The name is all Greek, Deinonychus meaning terrible claw, and antiropus meant counterbalancing. This was the theorised purpose of the stiff tail. Based on all of these bones, Ostrom wrote an exhaustive description of Deinonychus in 1969, all 186 pages of it, and it sent shockwaves through paleontology. Since the discovery of Archaeopteryx in 1861, the link between dinosaurs and birds had been proposed, but no one could see a link between these large lumbering lizards and modern graceful birds. It was obviously a primitive bird, but there was no link to dinosaurs. Yet here was a dinosaur, a clear theropod, built more like an agile big cat than a lumbering lizard, with bird-like claws. This animal's body was designed to be run by a warm-blooded lifestyle, and it had many bird-like features. This pushed John Ostrom to hypothesise that birds were even descended from theropod dinosaurs. This bird relation, the idea that birds and dinosaurs belong to the same group, has been called the dinosaur renaissance and has shifted our understanding of the view of the Mesozoic world. And it all began with this one dinosaur. As more Deinonychus material was found, 
Ostrom's reconstruction became even more bird-like. The hands were compared directly to those of Archaeopteryx, and the pubis was retroverted, like a bird. But that all-important first specimen had more tricks in his rock matrix. Shattered around the rock were a few odd pieces that were labelled bone fragments. These turned out in 2006 to be pieces of eggshell. The first Deinonychus egg had been discovered with the first and most complete Deinonychus, 75 years after it had been found. When people hear awesome dinosaur terminology, a common phrase is, that would make a great band name. Well, a bunch of Dutch musicians seem to think that with Deinonychus. The doom metal band Deinonychus has been going since 1992, and is still active. But Deinonychus the Dinosaur got its biggest boost in 1993, when it was involved in one of the greatest miscreditations in film history. The story goes that science fiction writer Michael Crichton was looking up dinosaurs for his new book. He came across a book of paleo art by Gregory S. Paul. In this book, Predatory Dinosaurs of the World, Paul took it upon himself to merge Deinonychus antiropus and Velociraptor mongoliensis to create the Frankenstein Velociraptor antiropus, thinking that Deinonychus was just an American species of Velociraptor, despite them being separated by continents and over 30 million years. While writing his book, Crichton had meetings with John Ostrom, who made it clear that they were not the same genus. Crichton took this on board and wrote the dinosaurs as Deinonychus, but held fast on the name. Velociraptor was more dramatic, apparently. When his book Jurassic Park was made into a film, this naming was carried over. The raptors, as they were often referred to, were designed around the look and size of Deinonychus, but were called something different. Suddenly, everyone knew Deinonychus, but got its name wrong. Also, the film Velociraptors have developed to become more like Dakota Raptors or Utah Raptors by getting even bigger than Deinonychus. A full-grown Deinonychus could reach 3.4 metres long, most of it tail. Not quite tall enough to look an adult human in the eye, but neither can a lot of other deadly animals. Deinonychus belong to a group of theropods called the Mani Raptors, notable for their bird-like hands and strong evidence of feathers. This group contained the Oviraptosaurs, among others, and the Eumaniraptors, or True Maniraptors. In this are the Truodontids and Dromaeosaurids, both slight, agile dinosaurs with sickle-shaped claws. Eudromaeosaurs, or True Dromaeosaurs, are a member of this Dromaeosaurid group, and have two main categories, the Dromaeosaurines and the Velociraptorines. Oddly, there is no consensus whether Deinonychus was a Dromaeosaurine, a Velociraptorine, or some other eudromaeosaur. Deinonychus's face has undergone several changes. At first, Ostrom reconstructed the skull from several broken pieces, resulting in a rather triangular, broad head, similar to earlier carnosaurs. When a three-dimensional skull was studied in the mid-90s, it turned out that the skull was narrower, more like Dromaeosaurus, although not as low and gharial-like as Velociraptor. The earliest reconstructions of Deinonychus showed it being scaly, but evidence has piled up that all dromaeosaurs not only had feathers, but had fully fledged veined feathers. The Chinese Microraptor shows a feathered body, arms and legs, and was older and more basal, or primitive, than Deinonychus. In 2007, the arm of a Velociraptor was found with little notches for feather quills. Skin and feathers have never been found directly associated with Deinonychus, but it was almost definitely feathered and if Deinonychus was anything like the feathered Cynoceropteryx, it would have been quite showy. Analysis of the preserved feathers of Cynoceropteryx showed melanosomes, the microscopic structures in modern feathers that provide pigment. Although the pigment has not been preserved, the shape of the melanosomes imply what pigment they might have produced. Using modern melanosomes for comparison, it appears that Cynoceropteryx was a reddy brown, almost ginger colour, countershaded with a lighter belly, a dark and light stripy tail, and a raccoon-like burglar's mask. This is what dinosaurs were doing with feathery fluff, similar to bird down. Deinonychus had full feathers, so what more could it have done? High contrast patterns would have been effective camouflage, breaking up the outline, and act as display structures in courtship or rivalry displays. The arms of Deinonychus seem to have been covered with veined feathers, which would have impeded the use of the hands. It also could not fly, a bit obvious in my opinion, but studies have confirmed. So what function did they serve? Well, Deinonychus had limited movements of its hands. It held them with the palms facing each other, 
clap hands rather than pianist hands, as one paleontologist put it. They were held with the hands pointing forward instead of tucking in like a bird. It had no rotation in the wrist, so they were stuck like this. No opening doors for this dinosaur. The arms could lift in a very flap-like motion, leading many to look at birds for comparison. Some birds of prey flap to keep themselves steady when suppressing prey. I'll come back to this later. And ostriches use their wings to help them bank and weave while running. Either or both of these are possibilities, and the change in direction while running brings us to speed. How fast was Deinonychus? For bipedal runners, a general rule of thumb is to look at the longest bone of the foot, the metatarsus, and compare it to the tibia. In ostriches, for example, the metatarsus, in red, is 95% the length of the tibia, shown here in blue. Almost the same. Going more non-avian, we have Struthiomimus. Fitting, really, as the name means ostrich mimic. Its metatarsus was 68% the length of its tibia. But what about Deinonychus? 48%. Not even half as long. Agile? Speedy? Maybe. But this animal was not built specifically for running. But how fast was it? Cheetahs have been estimated to reach maximum speeds of 65 to 75 miles per hour. Ostriches about 34 to 43 miles per hour. There being no Struthiomimuses around, we have to use estimates, which vary between 30 and 55 miles per hour. There was a lot of speculation regarding Deinonychus until 1981, when tracks were discovered in Canada. You can't be sure what made fossilised tracks unless you find the maker dead at the end, but the size and shape of these suggested Deinonychus. The stride and general anatomy put Deinonychus's walking speed about 6 miles per hour by the researchers. To put that in perspective, a Deinonychus could walk a 10k in under an hour. Using this, they estimated its running speed at 25 to 35 miles per hour. Humans, by comparison, start out about 5 miles per hour for marathon running, climbing to running speed up to sprinting, reaching the human world speed record of 23.3 miles per hour. So Deinonychus could definitely beat Usain Bolt in a foot race. But that's not the end of it. Humans and cheetahs are mammals. Olympic athletes can attain over 20 miles per hour for the 10 seconds it takes them to run that 100 meters. Cheetahs can only reach their top speed for maybe 3 seconds. During a chase, they average a much slower speed. A cheetah was made to run the 100 meters and did it in 5.95 seconds, averaging 37.6 miles per hour. Mammals have to sprint anaerobically, starving their muscles of oxygen that they just can't get into their system fast enough. Birds and dinosaurs don't have this problem. Using their air sacs, air is constantly passing through their lungs, keeping their blood oxygenated and those muscles running. But what does this mean in a practical sense? If a cheetah can maintain its top speed for 3 seconds, and a human 10, how long for an ostrich? A minute? 5 minutes? Try half an hour. So Deinonychus could not only run faster than a human, it could run for a lot longer too. But why wasn't it more like Struthiomimus with those long metatarsals? Well, it's probably to do with the claw. Often described as a sickle-shaped claw, due to its resemblance to the farming tool, this is a distinctive part of dromaeosaurid and troodontid anatomy. Having one large claw that was kept off the ground, according to physiology and track evidence, points to it having some importance. The muscles and joints around it were complex, and so the idea is that Deinonychus was trying to strike a balance between having decent legs for running while maintaining the kind of control required to use that claw. The large claw was sported by the second toe from the inside of the foot. The claws weren't uniform across individuals. They differed slightly in their curve, but it's not known whether this was individual difference or change as the animal grew. There is one line of thinking that I should probably put out there. In 2009, a stress analysis showed that Deinonychus' claws were well adapted to supporting the body's weight in a vertical plane against gravity. The claws, and particularly the one on the second toe, could have been used like tree climbing spurs used by arborists. The idea is sometimes elaborated that Deinonychus' claw grew straighter as the animal aged and left the trees. Also, this arboreal lifestyle led feathered dinosaurs to develop flight. One of the earliest dromaeosaurs to use a large second toe claw was Utah Raptor, about 139 million years ago. Estimates put it at over 4.5 metres long and weighing over a quarter of a tonne. Even a small one would not be the best example of a tree climber. 
Also there is the range. Dromaeosaurs and their sickle-shaped clawed relatives spread to every continent and every environment in the northern hemisphere of the Cretaceous. In North America, they became one of the two major carnivore groups. Velociraptor was rampant in late Cretaceous Mongolia, where trees weren't exactly common. This diversity and reach speak to me of a capable and adaptive lifestyle rather than being tied to one environment. So what else could that claw be used for? Well, if it was like a sickle, curved and sharp, it could be used to slash and disembowel prey. This explanation has been the go-to since it was proposed by Ostrom in the 1970s. But there is a flaw. While the bone of the claw was probably covered by a sheath of keratin, there is no sign of a cutting edge on the inside of the curve. In 2005, a robotic dromaeosaur leg was constructed based on calculations from Deinonychus and Velociraptor for strength and movement. It could easily cut through leather, but if you add flesh, the blunt underside got the claw stuck. Once again, just because something looks similar doesn't mean it was used for the same thing. An interesting theory is that getting stuck in flesh was exactly what these claws were supposed to do. With the rise of large ornithopods, the idea is that dromaeosaurs would ambush or run down these animals. Using their claws, they would latch onto the ornithopod's flank. Those claws, so suited to supporting the animal's body weight, would have allowed them to hold on to their prey, and use a strong bite to the neck to bring it down. I apologise for the featherless dromaeosaurs used here, but this footage just illustrates the idea too well for me not to use it. Deinonychus fossils are often found with the ornithopod Tenontosaurus, and while there is a lot of focus on Deinonychus's claw, many overlook its bite. In 2005, a study with the great name Bite Me came up with bite forces for dromaeosaurs based on biomechanical comparisons with American alligators and Komodo dragons. As a quick reminder from my Allosaurus profile, a human bites with their molars with around 890 newtons of force. A Rottweiler with 1,490 newtons. A bone-crushing hyena with 3,600 newtons. And a typical American alligator with about 9,450 newtons, although the highest recorded goes above 13,000. This study put Deinonychus at biting with 1,450 newtons almost the same as a Rottweiler. For the authors of this study, this disqualified Deinonychus from using its jaws for killing significant prey. They conclude that the weak bite could have meant one of three things. 1. Deinonychus used its bite for small or wounded prey. 2. Deinonychus used its jaws for slashing rather than biting attacks. Or 3. Deinonychus only used its jaws for feeding. This confirmed the standard theory that Deinonychus' talents lay in its claws rather than its jaws until a find from 2003 was studied in 2010. Yes, these things take time. A partial Tenontosaurus skeleton was unearthed, which revealed numerous bite marks on the bones, which turned out to be a match for Deinonychus. To puncture bones in this way, a force of at least 3,135 newtons was required, over double that of previous estimates. By looking at the bite marks, a 2010 study calculated that Deinonychus could bite with much greater force. They came out with 4,100 to 8,200 newtons, depending on the size of the individual and position of the bite, similar to most alligators. This enables Deinonychus to have used its killing bite on large animals such as Tenontosaurus. These strong bites, though, were probably used rarely and not used when eating, accounting for the relative lack of marking on bones. Although, there is an alternative line of thinking in how individual dromaeosaurs killed their prey. And now we get to talk about my favourite fossil, the Mongolian fighting dinosaurs. This, found in 1971, seems to preserve a Velociraptor mongoliensis and Protoceratops andrusi locked in combat when a sandstorm or sand dune collapse buried them. I could go on for hours about this find, but this video is long enough, so I'll just say that the Velociraptor here is kicking at the Protoceratops' neck as it's wrestled to the ground. It seems to be using those claws as stabbing implements in combat. Some have gone far enough to suggest that dromaeosaurs aimed their claws at the neck to sever the carotid artery, the jugular vein, or puncture the windpipe. I do not think this is likely. Big cats have the neck attack down to an art, and this involves others holding the prey still while one goes for the kill. It is a precise strike, 
with the whiskers able to feel out the vital point. Velociraptor had none of this going for it. It was apparently alone, and not exactly in control of the situation. There is, though, a group of animals today with long stabbing claws on their feet. Modern raptors, eagles and hawks. They use a technique called raptor-prey restraint, or ripper for short. It involves pinning the prey to the ground with the claws, rupturing internal organs, and causing severe blood loss. The predator often begins feeding while the prey is still alive. Lovely. Denver Fowler proposed that dromaeosaurs used ripper in 2011, and it certainly is compelling. While called raptor prey restraint, his analysis found that Dynax's foot was most similar to that of owls, which also use this technique to devastating effect. With this, the long tail would be used for balance, and the feathers on the arms would help rather than hinder. Flapping would help with balance, and add force to pin the prey. With multiple stabs of that claw pinned under the weight, feeding could begin. To me this seems likely enough, but obviously this would not take down a Tenontosaurus. Backtracking slightly to the two types of dromaeosaurs, the dromaeosaurines and the velociraptorines. The classification can vary, bringing in small features of the skull and teeth serration, but basically it depends whether it was stronger and stockier, like a dromaeosaurus, or slimmer and lighter, like a velociraptor. Dromaeosaurines had the muscular build to take on larger prey, and the jaws necessary to perform the stranglehold, but were easily capable of ripper. Velociraptorines had slender jaws, not able to perform strangleholds, but were fast and agile enough to catch more prey through ripper. Neither was necessarily better than the other. Dromaeosaurines were more generalised, and Velociraptorines were more specialised. Both groups had members through to the end of the Cretaceous. Dynonychus seems to have been in between the two. Dynonychus would have been able to use ripper against smaller animals, like Zephyrosaurus, but gang upon larger prey, like Tenontosaurus and use the stranglehold technique. And ganging up invites the question, was Deinonychus a pack hunter? Well, we know that Deinonychus did gather together. There are multiple tracks following dinosaur herds. Two sites containing Tenontosaurus and Deinonychus have evidence of multiple individuals which fed on and probably killed the ornithopod. As the former was at most a tenth of the weight of the latter, it's generally agreed that a single Deinonychus could not do it. It would be like a lion trying to take on an elephant. But a pack is a different story. Without a single attacker to focus on, a large animal can be overwhelmed by a large number of far smaller predators. In some conditions, lions can bring down an elephant. Could Dynicus have done something similar? Ostrom and Maxwell found this evidence compelling. Some did not. A 2007 study pointed out that living archosaurs, crocodiles and birds, do not form packs like mammals. They're usually solitary, only cooperating at large gatherings, like crocodiles during migration, or with tricky prey, like Harris hawks. It proposed that these were the conditions that Dionychus probably engaged in temporary group behaviour, called cooperative hunting. But if Dionychus did not kill these Tenontosaurus, what did? The main other predator in this area was over three times longer, and maybe over 30 times heavier not something that would be easily chased from a kill by some pesky dromaeosaurs. So, if cooperative hunting is on the table, what about pack hunting? Well, a study in 2020 attempted to answer this question. If Deinonychus hunted in packs, probably family groups, the diets of the juveniles would have been the same as the adults. The chemical isotope composition of teeth from juvenile and adult Deinonychus were analysed and were found to be different. Juveniles seemed to hunt smaller carnivores, and adults hunted the larger herbivores. Animals like Tenontosaurus were probably hunted by adult Deinonychus, because they had the necessary experience to kill the prey, work cooperatively with other predators, and know when and where provided a good opportunity for cooperation. It would also help being able to hold your own in a predator feeding frenzy where no one cared if you were added to the menu, as appeared to have happened with smaller Deinonychus having pieces missing. Groups of adult Deinonychus probably gathered around migrating herds and worked together just long enough to make the kill. Deinonychus, particularly young individuals, would probably have been solitary most of the time, like the Velociraptor in the fighting dinosaurs. No pack mates were rushing in to save this one's hide. So we know that Deinonychus probably lived alone, but they didn't come into the world that way. Manoraptors probably showed brooding behaviour similar to modern birds. This is best shown in the Oviraptorids. There are many examples of these dinosaurs sitting over a nest with their feathered arms covering them. 
The example of a Dionychus egg that we have show that they were more similar to Oviraptoroids than their closer relatives the Truodontids. They had an ovular shape, about 7 cm in diameter, and were laid two at a time in concentric circles. Similar sized Oviraptorids often laid 22 in a nest, although these may not have been laid at the same time, in one sitting as it were. Science is a remarkable thing. I've mentioned how techniques showed how feather colour could be interpreted from fossilised feathers, but in 2018 it was demonstrated that it could be done with fossilised eggs. The team used Raman spectroscopy, which uses the Raman effect, named after its discoverer and winner of the Nobel Prize in Physics, Sir C. V. Raman. This fired different types of laser light at the surface and detected the scatter, inferring the original surface pigment. They concluded that Dionychus eggs were blue-green with brown speckles, again similar to other apterids. This would have been useful for animals laying eggs uncovered on the ground, a form of camouflage and recognition. This had major implications for colour in bird eggs. It seems that colour evolved in the Manoraptors, and then was lost as birds began burying their eggs and building nests in trees, only for some species to regain the pigment. In 2015, two Ophiraptorids belonging to the Khan genus were found together. They were seemingly male and female, and appeared to have died in the same sand dune collapse only 20 centimetres apart. The two were occasionally called Sid and Nancy, but were most commonly referred to as Romeo and Juliet. The team obviously preferred a Shakespeare reference over a 1986 film about the Sex Pistols bassist. We don't know whether this is evidence of mating for life, but it does show that the pair spent time together, able to split brooding and foraging duties. Having the most reproductive similarities to Dionychus, parenting may have been a dual affair for dromaeosaurs too. Also, a group of Utah raptors were discovered in an apparent mud-miring trap, including adults and a hatchling, introducing the possibility that dromaeosaurs cared for their young after hatching before they went off on their own. While pop culture has focused on dromaeosaur brains, we know relatively little about them. Many of the brain cases that exist are incomplete, and dromaeosaur-specific research has been rare. We do know some things, however. While dromaeosaurs, and particularly truodontids, had some of the largest brain-to-body size ratios of all Mesozoic dinosaurs, cognitively, modern birds leave them in the dust. The large brain was mostly there to process the massive amount of information coming from the sensitive eyes, ears, and nostrils. A study carried out on velociraptor ear canals also indicates that they had good coordination, able to dodge and weave while keeping prey in its sights. But problem solving? No. They had similar cognitive abilities to an eagle or hawk, certainly not the reasoning and ability to work out issues seen in some birds such as crows. Dinonychus lived 115 to 108 million years ago, in the Aptian and Albion ages of the early Cretaceous. While Dromaeosaurs managed to thrive in all sorts of environments in the Northern Hemisphere, from the sparse deserts of Mongolia to the cold northern regions. Dinonychus lived in a subtropical area with swamp forests, deltas and lagoons, in many ways like modern Louisiana. They are mainly found in the northern United States and Canada. Most fossils are found around the large Western Interior Seaway, which would later split North America in two. Dinonychus lived alongside a variety of fishes, turtles and small lizards and mammals. Bernisartia was one of the smallest ever crocodilians, and was likely a nice snack for Dinonychus, provided more competition with the crocodilians Paluxysuchus and the large Goniophilus. Fellow dinosaurs included the Ornithopod Tenontosaurus, which we know was at the very least eaten by Dinonychus, the Nodosaurid Sauropelta, whose armour would have given it a good defence against Dromaeosaurid claws, and the little Ornithopod Zephyrosaurus. These shared many of the swampy areas. The floodplains were dominated by some of the largest animals on the planet at the time. Through the late Cretaceous, the large sauropods were confined to the southern hemisphere. But here, in the early Cretaceous, they were not going to leave quietly. There was the Titanosaur Astrodon, named after star-shaped structures in its teeth, and the enormous Sauro Poseidon, the lizard earthquake god. If we had to lose the name Seismosaurus, at least we still have names like this. No matter how many Dionychus there were, they had no chance against one of these. But where there were large sauropods, there were also large carnosaurs, and the Cretaceous was the period of the huge Carcharodontosaurs, like Aquacanthosaurus, an Allosaurus relative channeling Spinosaurus with a small sail running down its back. Dionychus provided the first glimpse of dinosaurs as active and agile animals. 
It opened the door to a relationship with birds that ushered in the dinosaur renaissance, and remained a relevant case throughout. Whether eggs, feathers or hunting strategies, this dinosaur provides a unique perspective. There are numerous raptors. This is Deinonychus. Thanks for watching. If you liked this video, show your opinion with a thumbs up and share it with others. Maybe subscribe if you'd like to see more videos like this. Why not post a comment on what dinosaur you'd like me to do a profile on next? If you want to further support this channel, I have a book available on iBooks. It's interactive, has original illustrations, and has a number of interesting dinosaurs in it. Link in the description. When we last looked at sauropods, we looked at the lengths they went to with Diplodocus. Next, we will focus on the heights they reached. A dinosaur profile on Brachiosaurus.